No, I got to take the Reverend Doctor and his wife Nancy out to eat for dinner last night, and everything I heard about him was was true. I mean, this man. Uh, usually, you meet like people who have kind of big deal jobs, like he does as the president of Western Seminary, and uh, you know, they're just there's a high level of we'll call it confidence um, there. And I just sensed this spirit of humility that was really kind of shocking. And uh, the way that I felt like he actually had compassion for myself and for my wife um, was really refreshing. And it was just a wonderful conversation. Um, some background on him. Him and his wife um, got to be a part of building uh, one of the largest churches of the 1980s. As um, Charles Stanley was to the south, so Tim Brown was to the north. He built a church that at that time was one of the largest in the country, um, the fastest growing, the largest church in non-metropolitan areas uh, at over 3,000 people a weekend. And uh, my favorite part about his story is that the pinnacle of ministry, I mean, he had like the best calling. Every pastor would want that. Um, he just told us, you know, I really felt a calling to lift up the next generation of preachers. And so he took a huge cut in prestige, influence, and pay um, to go and teach preaching teach communication and preaching at Western Seminary. And uh, even to this day, he raises up the next generation of preachers. And uh, to me, what a distinct and amazing privilege to be a part of doing that. And I just want you to know today, we have a really unique privilege um, to have one of the greatest communicators um, from his generation come out and be here. Let's give it up for Tim Brown. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. May the Lord forgive John for exaggerating like that, and may the Lord forgive me for loving it. Thank you very, very much. So grateful to be here at First Church DeMott. Um, I, I love your young pastor. We had dinner last night, we, that is my wife Nancy and I, and um, one of our advancement guys at Western Seminary, whom I love like a son, Andy Bast, is here as well. We had dinner last night, and I learned three things about John. The first thing I learned is he is seriously intense. I would, enc I would encourage you to not allow him to drink caffeinated beverages. He doesn't need it. The, the other thing I, I learned about him is that he loves Jesus and really wants people to know him. And in that same vein, he loves you. And that is a, a beautiful thing. And the third thing that I learned is he is absolutely a living commentary on a Bible verse. This Bible verse. It is not good that the man shall be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So the Lord formed Kristen just for John. And I think that's terrific. I think you deserve, they both deserve love. Now, I am pretty eager to preach, so I'm going to get right down to business. Pray with me, please. Father, may your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and the glory of Jesus our single concern, in whose name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, listen to just this short verse, one short verse, but it's packed from the pen of the Apostle Paul writing to young Timothy. And what you have heard from me through many witnesses and trust to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Okay, it's just a short verse, so let me do it a second time. Listen very careful, carefully. And what you have heard from me through many witnesses and trust to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Now, when you conceive of the Christian life in just these terms, it makes it sound to me a bit like a relay race, like, like a, a 440 relay race where everybody's running 110 yards. What you have received from me through many other witnesses and trust to someone who will be able to entrust it to another also. You see it? The Apostle Paul picks up something from one generation or someone else, passes it on to the next person who passes it on to the next person. And everything depends upon the baton exchange. You can't drop the baton. Everything depends 
between heaven and earth on our capacity to receive the baton and to pass it off, which is to say that this is fairly serious business that we're about here in the church. We've received a baton and we've got to pass it on so it can continue to pass, be passed on. Well, you keep that metaphor in your mind uh, while I tell you a story. Um, I'm not gonna make the story up. Every word of it is found somewhere in the Bible. It's, it's about the most remarkably precise picture of what it means to receive a baton and pass it on. Would you like to hear the story? That's good, because I'd love to tell it. It goes like this. When the time had come for the Lord to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way together from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. Elisha said to Elijah, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went down to Bethel. Now the company of prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you, do you not know that today the Lord will take your master from you? Elisha said, yes, I know, be silent. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Jericho. Elisha said to Elijah, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now, the company of prophets who were at Jericho came out to Elisha and they said to him, do you not know that the Lord will take your master from you today. He said, I know, be silent. So Elijah and Elisha continued on. Elisha said, stay here for the Lord has sent me as far as the Jordan. Elisha said to Elijah, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on to the Jordan. Now the company of prophets who were at Jericho followed them at a distance. And when they came to the Jordan, Elijah took off his mantle and he rolled it up and he struck the water and the water parted from one side to the other. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they were on the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, what would you have me do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha said, oh, please, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elijah said to Elisha, you have asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me taken from you, it will be done for you. If you cannot, it will not. So the two of them continued walking and talking and, and suddenly chariots of fire and horses of fire separated Elijah and Elisha and Elijah was carried up to heaven by a whirlwind. Elisha, looking up, kept crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. When, when he could see him no longer, he knelt down and picked up Elisha's mantle, Elijah's mantle. He went back to the Jordan, rolled it up, and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And he struck the water, and it parted from one side to another, and he crossed over on dry ground. Now, the company of prophets who had followed them were standing at a distance and they saw Elisha and they said, look, the spirit of Elijah has fallen upon Elisha. They came to him and bowed before him. And they said to him, look, there are 50 strong men among the prophets of Jericho. Send us to search for Elijah, who knows? Maybe the Lord has dropped him down on a high mountain or in a deep valley. Elisha said to them, don't go. 
But when they urged him, he became ashamed, and he said, go. So 50 strong men from the company of prophets searched for three days for Elijah, and they could not find him. They returned to Elisha, for he remained in Jericho, and they said to him, we could not find him. Elisha said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Just then some people from the city came out to Elisha, and they said to him, Look, the location of our city is good, but the water is foul and the land is unproductive. Elisha said to them, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought him a bowl with salt in it and Elisha went to the well of the city and he cried out with a loud voice, where is the Lord, the God of Israel? He threw the salt into the well and the water of Jericho has been sweet to this day on account of the word that was spoken by Elisha. Just then, Elisha turned and went on his way toward Mount Carmel. As he was going, some small boys came out from the undergrowth and they jeered Elisha saying, go away, bald head, go away, bald head. And Elisha turned and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And just then, two she-bears came out from the undergrowth and mauled 42 boys. And Elisha went on his way to Mount Carmel. This is the word of the Lord. Now, it would be customary for you to say after that, thanks be to God, but I understand why you're not doing that. How do you say thanks be to God to a story like that? I find this story odd and challenging and deeply moving. Let me start with the odd part first. What's up with the mauling of 42 boys? Should something like that be in the Bible? I don't, I don't think so. But there's good news. We have interpretive options available to us. We could adopt the higher critical methodology handed on to us from the Enlightenment and just explain it away with some sleight of hand. Or we could since Bible reading in the United States is at an all-time low, we could say to ourselves, well, just say nothing about it. Just ignore it. Don't even read it. And hopefully no one else will read it too. But we know that the Apostle Paul once said that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. So there is profit in this biblical story, and we have to squeeze the profit out. That's P-R-O-F-I-T, the profit, the good that's in it. So here's what I think's at stake in this story. The whole story in my mind is actually a kind of living commentary on another verse in the New Testament. This one from 2 Corinthians 2. Paul says, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are perishing and among those who are being saved. To the one we are a fragrance of death to death. And to the other, we are a fragrance of life to life. That's remarkable. We are the aroma of God to Christ. So much hangs in the balance in, on who we are as children of the living God. So here's what I'm thinking. The boys come out and they jeer Elijah or Elisha, go away, bald head, go away, bald head. Now, I want you to know that I don't think there's a hair's breadth of a chance that Elisha is actually congenitally bald. He's not bald, he's shaven. And there's a big difference. In the ancient Jewish practice of bereavement, when you have lost someone you love, there is a 72-hour period actually called Avelu, 
in which the grieved, those who have loved and lost, are set free from all requirements of the law, and their only duty before God is to grieve the one whom they have loved and lost. And then on the fourth day, they begin a practice called Shiva, sitting Shiva. That's a seven-day practice in which people may come and console them. It's actually alluded to in the New Testament. If you read John 11, the death of Lazarus, we're told specifically that Jesus comes to Mary and Martha at Bethany on the fourth day. It was the first day that they were receiving visitors. They had gone through the three days of Ave Lu, bitter grief. And during the period of Ave Lu, men, men and women are to cover themselves in sackcloth and ashes, and the men are required to shave their head. Go away, bald head, go away, bald head. They were not mocking his hairstyle. They were mocking his love for Elijah. Now, let me tell you something else that's interesting. The name Elijah, El, Yah, in Hebrew, simply means, or profoundly means, God is among us. Elisha in Hebrew means El, God, Ish, man. God has become a man. The combination of Elijah and Elisha are pointers to Jesus, the one who is to come, the God who is among us, the God who was a man who came to save us. The point being that when the children were jeering Elisha, the God-man, they were jeering the offer of God's grace to be saved, and there is a price to pay for that. Let it be known to you that God is not mocked, for whatever you sow, you also reap. And if you forever ignore the gracious advances of God, you will one day be lost. There's another scripture that says, he who hardens his heart, being often reproved, will one day be cut off, and that without remedy. There is an, ama an amazing elasticity in the love of God, but it is not infinitely elastic. Somewhere it snaps, and you've lost your opportunity. That's what's at stake in this story. They were rejecting the God of Israel, and to reject the God of Israel is to reject life itself. That's the part that I find odd, almost repulsive. But let me tell you about the part that I find uh, moving, deeply moving, really. It's that moment between Elijah and Elisha when Elijah says, not once, not twice, but three times, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel, as far as Jericho, as far as the Jordan. And each time, Elisha says, no, no, as God lives and as you live, I will not leave you. Elisha was so deeply dependent upon Elijah. He wanted to suck the life out of Elijah. Whatever he had, Elisha wanted. Do you remember what Elijah said to Elisha? What would you have me do for you before I am taken from you? Please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. The point being, he wanted to take everything from Elijah before, before he was taken up to glory. The point being, we need, as the people of God, to make children of God to disciple them. One of the wonderful things that I find exciting about this congregation is the way that you've taken evangelism seriously. There are any number of people here who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, and this is their first church home. Way to go, first church. You have received a baton, and now you are being readied to pass that baton on, and you must be ready to do that. I want to tell you a story of, uh, from my pastoral days. It's a long time ago now, but the story lives with me so deeply. It was right at, the, right at the forefront of that rapid growth that John was talking about. It was a very exciting time to be at Christ Memorial Church in Holland. 
But something was happening inside of me. With all the excitement of all the growth, my heart was being turned to the need of just one person in the congregation. His name was Tim Vanderveen. He was a, a college kid. He was an all MIAA soccer player, Phi Beta Kappa. He had long, curly brown hair, a smile as bright as the dawn. He was seriously cool. He used to work the lobby of our church after worship services like a politician working, running for office. Everybody loved him. Every mother wanted their daughter to marry Tim Vanderveen. But there was something happening inside of him that nobody knew anything about. I came to know it when his mother called me. He had been diagnosed with leukemia. He was dying. And I was committed to walking with that boy, hopefully to the point where God would miraculously heal him, or if not, to that point where the Lord would take him up to glory. I remember very vividly being in Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago one night when he was suffering deeply and he begged me, he begged me to heal him. He thought I had the power to heal him. I prayed for it, I prayed diligently, but the Lord had other ideas in mind. So now I want you to come with me to Grand Rapids, Michigan to Blodgett Hospital, no, excuse me, Butterworth Hospital, room 5053. I still make hospital calls from time to time and I hate that room to this very day. I entered the room, his mother was sitting on the end of the bed crying. If this was your son, you'd be crying too. Uh, Tim didn't have a lot of hair that day. In fact, he had no hair at all. He was so sore and tired, he couldn't even roll over to greet me, so I got down on my hands and knees. I said to him, hi, Tim. He said to me, hi, Tim. Now, I had been a pastor at that point for, I think, about 15 years and I still didn't know what to say. What do you say in the face of death? Well, as I'm imagining what I'm going to say, Tim broke the silence. He said to me, uh, Tim, I've, I've learned something. Now, I know this much, at least, you don't trifle with the words of a dying man. You listen very carefully. So I said to him, what have you learned? He said, I have learned that life is not like a VCR. Now, this story is dated, and you may not have any idea what a VCR is, but it was the forerunner of the DVD. <laughs> but you still get the point. And I said, okay, I don't get it. He said, Tim, it's not like a VCR. You can't fast forward the bad parts. He was going through the darkest part of his life, and he knew he had to pass through it. I'm thinking, where does he get this stuff? And then he breaks the silence and he says to me, but I have learned that Jesus Christ is in every frame and right now it's enough. It's enough. It's enough that God in Jesus Christ should be with us no matter where we are or what we're going through. It was enough for Ted and Joan Vanderveen, his mom and dad, when they rocked that little boy at the waters of baptism. It was enough for them that Jesus should be in the frame of their son's life when he chortled his way off to his first day of school. It was enough when he walked across the platform at Hope College, turning his tassel toward a very uncertain future, and it was just enough on room, in room 5053 that Jesus Christ should be in the frame. As the Lord lives and as you live, says Elisha to Elijah, I will not leave you. Elijah, Elisha, representatives of the fact that God is with us no matter who we are or where we are. That would have been a great place for you to say amen. God is with us no matter where we are or who we are. And it requires us to take this baton and pass it on because you don't know. I mean, can you imagine what it must be like to walk through the dark valley of the shadow of death and not know who Jesus is? 
It's your responsibility to make sure somebody knows. We can't let people live and die without him. Pass on the baton. Okay, I got one more thing I want to say. I find this story to be uh, odd for sure. I've already told you about that. I found this, I find this story to be deeply moving. I'm just telling you that now. But I also find this story to be incredibly challenging, remarkably challenging. What did you make of that moment? Uh, some people come to Elijah, Elisha, and they say to him, look, the location of our city is good, but the water is foul and the land is unproductive. Now, what you need to know about an ancient city, everything depends upon your water source. Jericho had a good location. It was high. It had, but it had no good water source. The water had turned foul. And if the water remains foul, the, the crops fail, and the people finally wither and die. So this is a life or death moment for them. And they come to Elisha, and they tell him this, and he says, give me a bowl with salt in it. I have no idea how to interpret that, but it's important to the story I know. They bring him a bowl, and then listen to this. Elisha goes to the well, and he cries out with a with loud voice, thus says the Lord, this water will no longer bring forth death or miscarriage. And then, in the text, we're told that the water of Jericho was sweet to this day on account of the word of Elisha. Now, that's a conundrum to me. Thus says the Lord, according to the word of Elisha. Thus says the Lord, says Elisha. And the Bible writer says, according to the word of Elisha. So which is it, the word of God or the word of Elisha? Is it God speaking or us speaking that makes the difference for eternity in the lives of people? The answer is yes, both. God speaks through us. Do you know this scripture from 2 Corinthians? The apostle Paul says, for it is God who makes his appeal through us. God has chosen to umbilicate himself and his purposes to us. It's you, you who God has chosen. And I know if you're, if you're like me, you think to yourself, well, who am I? You're you. And if I may quote Dr. Seuss, there's never been anyone ever you -er than you. It's you whom God has chosen. You live in Jasper County. God loves Jasper County, and it's you through whom he wants to reach this county. Do you get my point? It is you that God is calling into service. Your name is Elisha. Your name is Elijah. And in the purposes of God, he intends to use you. Now I'm just thinking of a poem by Walt Whitman. You can forget the name and the poem, but don't forget the, the sentiment of it. Oh me, oh life, of the questions of these recurring. What good among, amid these, oh me, oh life? The answer, that you exist, an identity, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. That's the point. God is calling each of us to contribute a verse to the great gospel song that's being sung all over the world. People are coming to Jesus through other people, and you are that other people. Okay, see how much time do I have? Oh, I've got enough time to invite you to come to me, with me, to San Diego. W would you like to go to San Diego? Yes. With some, maybe two, three times a year, I have reason to be on the West Coast. I typically fly into LAX, and most often I go north up the Central Valley to uh, cattle country, dairy country, up in Tulare or Ripon or something like that. But in this particular occasion, I've given myself an extra day so that when I land in LA, I can drive down to Escondido. I want to get to Escondido to go to a retirement home where the second oldest living alumni of Western Theological Seminary resides. His name is Harvey Hoekstra. Um, 
Harvey graduated from my seminary four years before I was born in 1947. He and his wife were zealous for the truth. So Harvey and Levina and their newborn son took a steamship to England where at Selly Oaks they did uh, translation training. He wanted to know how to translate the Bible into languages that don't have the scriptures. He wanted to know how to witness to people who know nothing about the gospel. He studied there for a year, and then Harvey and Levina were assigned to the Godery River Valley to work among the Masingo people, maybe 250 miles south, east, southwest of Addis Ababa. It was a long, arduous trip for Harvey and his wife and their now toddler son. Harvey tells me that when they landed or when they arrived in the harbor at Addis Ababa and they made their way, by the time they got to the last place where the train went, they then mounted horses and hacked their way through the jungle for 10 days to finally get to the Masingos, who are a warrior tribe. I mean, I just can't imagine. They're in their middle 20s, they have a small toddler son, and they're going that far just so that they can tell the good news of Jesus to someone. And here comes the really remarkable story. So it was very early on, they were living on the outskirts of the village, and one night there was a horrible monsoon rain with bolts of lightning and powerful rumbling of thunder, and Harvey with his little family in their tent, and every time a lightning bolt would hit and the light would shine, Harvey could see the silhouette of a man standing outside their tent. He thought to himself, tonight, I and my wife and my son will die. So at least to try to protect them, he stepped outside the tent and there was a powerful Masingo warrior with a huge machete attached to his side waiting for him. But he could tell that he was summoning him to come. Harvey thought, I must go. So he grabbed the back belt of the Masingo warrior who led him through the jungle in the driving rain to where was he going? He had no idea. He couldn't speak the language yet. But the man took him to his village where his child, his daughter, was shivering with a deep fever and the tribal warrior was so frightened. Harvey wasn't a medical doctor but he did have his medical bag with him. He applied a poultice on the child's wound, uh, gave some medication, and then just prayed, prayed hard through the night. But when the, mo and when the morning came, the fever had lifted and the, and the wound was beginning to heal. That tribal warrior, on the witness of Harvey's kindness, became a believer, and his seven wives, and their many children. The first Christians in the Godery River Valley. Then, Harvey and Levina labored hard among them, and the Lord's favor was upon them. And over the course of the next five or six years, 150 other Masingos became Christian believers. And then over the next decades, the number continued to grow until now Harvey and Levina are old and it's time for them to leave. They have to return to the, to the States, now well in his 60s. And when he leaves, there are over 500 Christians. It's a big congregation, but the story gets much better than that. Now, 20 years later, Harvey is 90 years old, and I'm visiting him in Escondido. He's suffering from uh, congestive heart failure. He's telling me about the invitation that he has received from the Odola Presbyterian Church in Ethiopia to come and speak at their general assembly, and he wants definitely to go. Now, I forgot to tell you something, that the 
Masingos did not like the name Harvey, so they changed it to Odola, the Odola Presbyterian Church. And Harvey said, pray for me, Tim, that the Lord will clear up my chest congestion and I can go. I prayed, and by God's grace, his congestive heart failure became strong. He made the flight to Ethiopia at the age of 90. And as he was landing on the strip that he himself had built 40 years before, there was a crowd of 20,000 Masingo Christians waiting for him. Now, when he got there, he discovered that there are now more than a million Christian believers among the Masingos, which means that they are now five times larger than the Reformed Church in America who sent him there. It's a relay race. Can't you see it? You take it from someone who gives it to someone else, who gives it to someone else still. The point being that God intends to use us in his purposes, and if we don't participate in the, re in the relay race, who is going to? Can you think of that? It's you whom God is calling to participate with him. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I charge you to do that, and that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you. What an inspiring story as we talk about the holiness of God, the fact that God is with us always, and the charge and mission of God in our lives. And uh, as we as a church get ready for our future, it just makes me think about the unique calling that we have, that we are just one small link in a long chain. Uh, at our old building, some of you guys don't remember this because you weren't there, we had a hallway with, I call it the hallway of mostly dead pastors. And uh, it had a picture of all the pastors who have pastored First Church over the last 125 years. And, um, you know, it's pretty cool to think that my picture is going to be up on that wall. But I know that 100 years from now, um, I'll be just like the rest of the pastors. They'll be like, oh, there's a guy. We don't know who he is, really. We just see his name, and he's clearly not Dutch. That's unique, but that's about it. Um, he's the first not white guy to lead this church. And uh, that's cool, but um, we'll be forgotten. Um, but our legacy will live. And uh, I love thinking about, oh, what an incredible story. I'm so moved. I love thinking about millions of people who are following Jesus uh, because of one man and his wife and their faithfulness. And I just pray and hope that we as a church will be faithful with all that God has entrusted us with. I pray that we could have a legacy like that. I want us to have a big vision, and I know we hear a story like that, and we think, oh, that's a long time ago. Um, but you know what? We still serve the same God who can do the same things through us. Wouldn't it be amazing at the end of our lives to look back and see millions of people in Indiana and in this region who love and follow Jesus um, we're going to close in a, a worship song, and as the band comes out, I want to invite the church to stand um, as we get ready to sing. And I just want to pray for, um, pray for us as we carry on the mission that God has given us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for um, giving us new life. Uh, by your work on the cross. We thank you that um, you allow us to be in the presence of your holiness through Jesus. And we thank you for the plan and purpose that you give to our lives um, as carriers of your gospel. And I just ask that as a church we would be faithful, um, that we would pass on the truth of your gospel to generation after generation. It's in the name of Jesus we ask and pray these things. All God's people said, amen.